Wild West sheriffs kept law and order on the frontier alongside fellow lawmen and the local citizenry. They've been dramatized, glamorized, and exaggerated in films and literature for generations. And yes, the life of a Wild West sheriff was dangerous, but it was also weird. Today we're going to find out what life was really like as a Wild West sheriff. But before we get started, this is a good time to subscribe to Weird History and leave us a comment or your favorite Wild West quote or saying. Now, get your six-shooter, you lily-livered landlubber. It's high noon in the Wild West. A Wild West sheriff had to be good with their guns, but skill with a firearm wasn't enough for a man to earn the badge. As elected officials, sheriffs were voted in by county residents, either at regular intervals or during special elections, so they had to be good with people, persuasive. In late summer 1869, James Butler Hickok, better known as Wild Bill, was elected sheriff of Ellis County, Kansas, by a population desperate to stop the ongoing mayhem. Hickok's tactics for keeping the peace were too aggressive for the good people of Kansas. After slaying at least two men, Bill Mulvey and Samuel Strahan, Hickok was voted out of office during the regular election in November. Hickok was defeated by Democratic candidate Peter Rattlesnake Pete Lanahan, his deputy. What a kick in the groin when the public votes their trust to a guy named Rattlesnake. Though he didn't win another term, Hickok's brief time as sheriff was credited by a Kansas newspaper for his endeavor to rid Hayes City of dangerous characters. When Bat Masterson campaigned for sheriff in Dodge City in 1877, he advertised in the local newspaper that he was earnestly soliciting the suffrages of the people for the office while assuring everyone that he was no politician. Masterson's campaigning paid off and he took office as sheriff of Dodge City in January of 1878. He became known to his constituents as cool, decisive, and a bad man with a pistol. Sometimes, being a sheriff in an old west town meant you'd experience long periods of nothing. There were some days when the most a sheriff would do was carry out menial tasks, like picking up trash around the main street. And sometimes, when real danger came into town, a sheriff could gather up a posse of men and deputize them if necessary. Rounding up a posse, which comes from the phrase posse comitatus, or made up of civilians, was one of the most powerful tools a sheriff had at his disposal, and it still remains in the law books today. In 1878, the federal government forbade the military from assisting with civilian posses, making the role of civilians that much more essential to maintaining order. Deputized posses like the Lincoln County Regulators, known for its inclusion of Billy the Kid, took part in numerous shootouts with rival posse led by Sheriff William Brady during the 1878 Lincoln County War. The conflict, which originated in the New Mexico Territory before it became a state, ultimately felled 19 men. Although movies and TV shows make it seem like guns and gun violence were unregulated in the Old West, there were many towns and cities that enforced strict laws prohibiting them. In Tombstone, which was located in the territory that would eventually become Arizona, visitors were required to surrender their weapons when they entered town. Men were supposed to hand over their weapons at a hotel or the local lawman's office. In 1881, the local lawman was town marshal Virgil Earp. In his struggle to control the streets of Tombstone, Marshal Earp deputized his two brothers, Wyatt and Morgan, as well as John Henry Doc Holliday, to help him maintain order. When cowboys Billy Clanton and Tom and Frank McClory refused to surrender the weapons to the Earps and Holliday, it led to a fight that left the cowboys six feet under. Tombstone made gun control popular, but it wasn't the only town or city with gun laws. Deadwood, South Dakota, Virginia City, Nevada, and Dodge City, Kansas attempted to regulate arms, albeit with varying degrees of success. Finally, in 1874, Dodge City banned weapons for anyone other than law enforcement officers. No person shall fire or discharge any cannon or gun, fouling piece, pistol, or firearm of any description, or fire, explode, or set off any squib, cracker, or other thing containing powder or other combustible or explosive material without permission of the mayor. While sheriffs served entire counties, they didn't have the final say when it came to the law of the land. Beside town marshals and other local lawmen, sheriffs interacted with and sometimes came up against federal marshals. Town marshals could be elected or appointed officials. Wyatt Earp served as deputy town marshal through Kansas, while his brother, Virgil, served as the town marshal in Tombstone. The U.S. Marshal Service was created in 1789, and it was tasked with handling matters that fell under federal jurisdiction such as serving warrants, arresting criminals, and transporting prisoners. 
During the mid and late 19th century, U.S. Marshals and Deputy Marshals traveled the Wild West, visiting towns with little to no law enforcement in place. When U.S. Marshals came across a county sheriff or town marshal, they might work with the local lawmen or they could just as easily be at odds with them. For example, Deputy Marshal Robert Weidenman and apprehended several local deputies of sheriff and fellow Deputy Marshal William J. Brady, only to be apprehended by Brady in return. Of course, you have to remember that there were always more jurisdictions at play. The military had enforcement officers of their own on the frontier, and in places like Texas, the Rangers patrolled the border with Mexico. While a sheriff had the power to form a posse, they also needed the judgment and balance to know when the posse went bad. For example, a posse could very easily turn into a vigilante group and take matters into their own hands while acting under the law. Usually, these vigilante groups would form in response to common crimes like property violations, especially horse thievery. Sometimes they'd form and target individuals who they thought didn't fit into the community. These vigilante groups were known to lynch, banish, or harass minorities and loose females. To be a sheriff in the American West meant finding a balance between the two. On one hand, vigilante groups could wreak havoc, but they also rooted out the crooks in your town. In Montana, Sheriff Henry Plummer headed a group called the Innocents. Innocents swindled, looted, and slew their way across Bannock. When the citizenry of Bannock found out, they put together their own posse of vigilantes to apprehend and lynch more than 20 members of the Innocents, including the sheriff, Plummer. As a sheriff in an old west town, one would never know when trouble might arise. Sheriff Tom Logan of Nye County, Nevada found this out the hard way. In 1906, Sheriff Logan lost his life while fighting an ill-tempered professional gambler. Logan was wearing only his nightshirt when he arrived at the mining town's house of ill fame, Jewel House. Sheriff Logan found a man named Walter Berrio fighting with May Biggs, the owner of the establishment. Berrio drew his weapon on the unarmed sheriff and fired at Logan five times. According to witness accounts, even after being struck, Logan was seen holding Barrio down on the ground, having hold of his hands in which the latter grasped a revolver. Sheriff Logan eventually succumbed to his gunshot wounds. The front page of the Sun's evening edition wrote of the lawman, when the most dangerous men were in the act of committing their misdeeds, instead of girding himself with weapons for a street parade and doing what some sheriffs do to attract attention, Tom Logan was one of the quietest men in the whole camp and always did his duty quietly and well. He would look down the barrel of a loaded gun without a quiver and he never thought anything of it. A model sheriff, a good citizen, Sheriff Logan was a man who was a benefit to the world in which he lived. Barrio was put on trial for Logan's slaying but was found not guilty when the jury decided he acted in self-defense. One of the many unromantic tasks sheriffs took on throughout the work week was collecting taxes, something their predecessors, English Shire Reeves, had done as well. Collecting taxes allowed sheriffs to not only pay themselves, but to compensate their deputies and any other staff that worked alongside them. As you may have guessed, not every sheriff was honest. Some sheriffs in the Wild West were outlaws, either in their previous roles or concurrently with serving the law. For example, Wyatt Earp was an outlaw for a time in his youth, while well, Sheriff David Updike in Ada County, Idaho, is believed to have been so unlawful that he extorted and stole thousands of dollars, including several bars of gold. Dave Updike was born in New York but moved to Boise, Idaho in 1864. He was elected the first sheriff of Ada County that same year. Soon, however, Updike had organized a group of men that was accused of a series of robberies and slayings. At the Port Neuf Canyon stagecoach robbery of 1865, it was becoming clear that Updike was involved in crooked activities. He supplied the criminals with weapons for the crime that resulted in an alleged five murders and $75,000 of gold going missing. Updike was later indicted for embezzling public funds and resigned his position as sheriff. He was executed by a vigilante group in April of 1866. To date, the gold has never been located. While everything we've seen in movies tells us otherwise, the life of a Wild West sheriff was often messy and unglamorous, and one gets the sense that this was a high-stress gig. Despite the pay and fringe benefits, their days were as stressful as people who enforce the laws of our cities and towns today. What type of sheriff would you be? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other stories from our weird history.